what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, I'm here with Paul Martino of Bullpen Cap. But before I formally introduce Paul, Paul, I always like to mention past episodes. It'd be interesting. And there's a, a lot of overlap here. You know, I released um, the interview with Alvy Ray Smith, um, who is a co-founder of Pixar. And Paul actually worked with Alvy Ray Smith. So he's going to maybe tell a little bit about that story. Um, also, uh, Nolan Bushnell. Uh, founder of Atari, uh, who was Steve Jobs' mentor. And Paul has some links to Steve Jobs um, through Bill Campbell. We'll talk about that. And then I uh, had the founder of Spot Hero on, which I know, Paul, you guys uh, invested in through Bullpen Cap. Um, so check out that episode on the episode. You know, and there was uh, there's so many good ones. I, I love Fabrice Grinda of FJ Labs talks about signing a deal with Snoop Dogg and other artists late night at a party. I think that's what it took to get the deal signed. So he showed up. And so check out that in many more episodes. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. Um, and we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. Um, we do that by helping you run your podcast. And Paul, I think you've got a sense from hopefully past episodes that the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships and profile them, what they're working on and the people and companies I admire. And I found no better way to do that than over the past 10 years, having them on my podcast, promoting that podcast on social media and all on my email list and everywhere else. So if you thought about doing a podcast, you should. So if you have questions, go to rise25.com, email us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm excited. A big thank you to Steve Hoffman. Uh, you could check out the website Founderspace. He introduced me to today's guest. And Founderspace is a global startup accelerator with over 50 partners, 22 countries, 50,000 entrepreneurs as members. Paul Martino is a venture capitalist. Paul, you're so modest, by the way. I, I asked for a bio from everyone. Paul gives me one sentence. I'm like, come on. I know, you know, he said venture capitalist, eight time company founder movie producer and now sports entertainment venue operator. I'm like, no, Paul, there's, there's way more to you than that one sentence, which we'll get into today. But he's managing partner at Bullpen Capital. A few of his eight companies, including Alpha Software, uh, a computer security firm acquired by Intertrust, Tribe, one of the world's first social networks, which has links to Zynga, I believe, um, and Aggregate Knowledge, a big data advertising attribution company acquired in 2014. By New Star, he produced the film Inside Game about the 2007 NBA betting scandal. You can check out his website and much more, bullpencap.com. Uh, Paul, thanks for joining me. It's pretty exciting. You see, I, I think that one sentence got it all. It, it, it did get it all. It did get it all. You know, and like Princeton Masters at Computer Science. I mean, you, you kind of self-proclaim blue-collar Philly. And then I look up your, your a master's in computer science from Princeton. So growing up in Philly, what did you want to be when you were growing up? I am doing exactly what I always wanted to do from a young age. Like literally when I was a kid, I was like, wow, I want to run a company. Like I, I want to lead a group. I want to build a product. Uh, I had an Atari uh, uh, you know, way back in the day, I had a TSR 80 in 1980. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I could code circles around the guys that my dad worked with at Unisys in Bluebell. And, you know, I was just at that age where I was the youngest, I, I was, I was the youngest you could be to have had a computer in your house your whole life. I just turned 47 last, last week. And so that was a very special time where if you if your dad happened to be a computer engineer at Unisys, you had a computer and you could learn how to code. And it was just an awesome time. I always knew I wanted to do this. I actually didn't like being in school because I felt like it was holding me back from going out to do the real thing. Um, and yeah, I ended up going to Princeton for grad school. By default, I was 20 years old. I, I didn't know what else I could do. There's no internet in, in there, there's no internet at that time, right? It's like what do you go do? I went to grad school and I stayed as long as I could to drop out and start a company. 
So when you went to Princeton, what were you thinking? Same thing. I'm going to find my co-founders of my first company here. I want to, I'm going to make it. And Uh, then right now you are in California, right? I'm sitting in Philly right now, but I split my time between the coast. So did you, when you split your time there is because that's kind of the hub for technology. At what point did you say, I'm, I'm just going to be where the action is. So I lived in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, right in, right at the Netscape headquarters, basically, because I did a deal with them. That's how I ended up dropping out of grad school, did a deal with Netscape and fun, fun, fun times. Was there for almost 13, 14 years and then decided to move back to Philly, which is where I'm from. And the only way to move back to Philly is if I went back to California a week a month to not get stale. And, and I kind of figured out how to hack the system. And at that time, people were like, Paul, you're leaving town. You'll never get. Now they're like, Martino, where did you go? That, maybe that was a good idea. Talk about, so LV Ray Smith, what's the connection there? So in between my um, sec, first and second year at Princeton, I applied for an internship at Microsoft. And again, it was just one of those things, you'd never do that as a grad student, but since I didn't really wanna be a grad student and I wanted to do company stuff, I applied. And I remember the people at Microsoft going, your resume's a little weird for this, but you're a good coder, come on out. And I interviewed with, the, with this gentleman who was in the graphics group. And I had no idea what my job was gonna be. And I get to the office a couple weeks later and I meet Alvy Ray Smith because they just bought Altamira and the graphics group is going to merge with Altamira, which is this new imaging processing software. And I'm now the junior developer working for Alvy Ray Smith on the next generation of photo editing. I was like, sounds pretty cool. So did, did people know the legend of Alvy Ray Smith, the, his background or? Of course people knew it, but Alvy is a really low key guy. And you had him on the show and, and I just, he wasn't the kind of person that was pounding his chest, walking up and down. You know, it was funny. I didn't remember he was a founder of Pixar until I saw your episode with him. That just goes to show you. So even though I worked with him, he was so all in on Altamira and, and, and beaten Adobe, the product became Microsoft Image Composer. And ultimately, Microsoft never really got behind the product, which was disappointing. But it was one of those things, I'm, I'm reading the interview, I'm like, oh shit, I forgot he was... <laughs> founders of Pixar, because even though I worked with him for, you know, a half a year or whatever it was, it just wasn't something that he wore on his sleeve at all. Yeah. Where did, when did Bill Campbell enter the picture? And talk, talk a little bit about Bill Campbell, who don't know Bill Campbell. Bill Campbell, the CEO coach to Steve Jobs, the CEO coach to Larry Page, and you name it, best CEO coach in the history of Silicon Valley. Uh, I was the CEO of, I think it was my third startup company, Aggregate Knowledge, in the summer of 06. Randy Komisar from Kleiner Perkins led an investment in the company. And Bill Campbell was by all means retired from the CEO coaching thing. You know, he, he was a curmudgeonly guy, grew up in Homestead, Pennsylvania. He grew up dirt poor, was a curmudgeon. He'd give you a big hug and then he'd insult you. It was just the perfect, perfect kind of, kind, kind of demeanor. And he's like, oh, I'm done with this. I'm sick of people trying to get my, their kids in the college for them or their interviews or I'm not going to meet nobody. Komisar is like, Bill, there's this kid I'm working with. He's from Philly. He's kind of like an asshole, just like you. <laughs> I know you don't do this anymore, but would you, would you take a meeting with him? And so I go into this meeting with Bill Campbell and I'm kind of thinking, old guy over the hill, going to give me a bunch of platitudes, like, oh, God, am I doing this favor to Randy Komisar? Bill and I get into that meeting 10 minutes. Bill's like, oh, my God. He's like, you and I were meant to work together. Let's go do this. And it was just one of those strange things where he didn't want to be there. I kind of didn't think it was going to work. And magic. He's like, yeah, I'm in. I'll be at your office three times a week for the rest of your life. Let's go. And it, it was really just one of those life altering moments because Bill didn't do this anymore. He didn't take people on anymore. He had Larry and he, and, and he had Steve Jobs and he was done. Um, what was it about that meeting, Paul, that you guys hit it off? It was that I was blue collar and you really hit on something very dear to my heart. Yes, I went to Princeton, but I was blue collar. How does that work? Bill and I both understood what that meant. Blue collar was an orientation around how your brain worked. 
It was, I have to eat what I kill. I have to earn everything I got. Everybody's against me. It's a mindset of, I grew up this way. And yes, you could have gone to Stanford and were from a wealthy family, but your brain was wired blue collar. Or you could have grown up dirt poor in Homestead and your brain was wired that way. So Bill and I always loved blue collar CEOs, but you couldn't tell it from their resume. You could only tell it when you met. And that's why that meeting was such magic. In 10 minutes, we, we, we knew that we were cut from this very specific cloth that was the same, that neither of our resumes would tell you. And that's why he's like, yeah, Martina, let's go do this. What are some favorite Bill Campbell moments? I want you to talk about one time where I think you were talking to him right before he was supposed to talk to Steve Jobs. Oh, yeah. So Bill Campbell used the Socratic method. And when you were one of Bill Campbell's students, he would use case studies from other students at that time. Now, I'm running a 60, 80 person company, kind of under the radar. It's, kinda, it's a cool up and coming company. Kleiner Perkins put some money in, right? Kind of cool. But I, I remember one day he had to see Steve Jobs in the afternoon and me in the morning. So he comes into the office. He goes, Martino, I'm seeing Steve this afternoon. You know, um, let's leave the office. Let's, let's, let's go take a walk around the office. Love to, take a, love to take a walk. So we walk out the office. We're in San Mateo. We're walking around the, the street, around the thing. He says, Paul, you know, you got to keep this confidential. But Steve uh, has had an exclusive distribution deal with AT&T. I don't know if you remember this. But when the iPhone came out, it was so dang expensive that he had to cut an exclusive deal with, I believe it was AT&T, because it was the only way he could get the, the phone in the hands of people at a reasonable price. He said, so he comes in and he's like, Paul, we're walking around. You know, so this is the first time Steve can break exclusivity and then go multimodal. What do you think he should do? Because I want your thoughts on this before I go see him. I'm sitting there, you know, I run an 80 person <laughs> data company. Steve runs like the most important company in the world. And he wants my opinion because he wants to talk it through with Steve. But what I realized at that point isn't so much that I was uniquely qualified to answer the question because I wasn't. But as another student in the Socratic method of Bill Campbell, this was the way he'd see how I'd think, how I'd work. He'd then tell a story about some small company thing that I was doing back to Steve so that Steve would stay grounded in understanding what it meant to be an entrepreneur. It's how Bill worked. It was part of the magic to the system. He didn't give a shit if I really knew the answer of big exclusivity. It was how he worked, though. What's another favorite Bill Campbell story or lesson? When I hired Dave Jakabowski to, to replace myself. So as the company grew up, we went from a, a hardcore SaaS company in data and analytics, which I was a very good CEO for, to being a much more advertising focused company. And I was oil and water with the ad execs. I really was. Just wasn't my shtick, hanging out with agency people, not my thing. And I told Bill, I said, Bill, I'm not the right guy to be the CEO anymore. I will find my replacement. I did. I found this great guy, Dave Jakabowski. Dave went on to be a big wig at, at Facebook, running all of their ad group at one time, is now the CEO of a company called Eureka. And Dave had to interview with Bill. Uh, and Dave is, not a, Dave is not a frail flower. But I tell you, he was crapping his pants when he had to go interview with Bill. It was the, maybe the one time in his life he was nervous. I said, Dave, I don't get to hire you unless Bill is impressed by, by what you do. And Dave's nervous. He's white knuckling the interview. At the end of the interview, I got a phone call from Bill Campbell. The phone call was five seconds. And I, I'm going to edit the words here so that, so that people don't, you know, go after Bill's legacy. So I'm, I'm going I'm to soften it a little bit. Martino, you found a Polish kid from Buffalo. Hire him. Click. Now, you can put in the rest of the words he probably said, but it was one sentence. That was the whole summary of the interview. Why was it one sentence? Because he knew I had found another blue collar person like me and Bill. There was nothing else to do. Go hire him. That's awesome. Paul, just take people through the trajectory, like in fast forward for a second. So after or, you know, Princeton, um, Apple software, like take me through some of the companies and your, the timeline. Yeah. So I, so I'm in grad school. I don't want to be there. I'm there to meet people to start a company. We end up having this, this gig at Netscape that gets me to form the company in the security space. A lot of my colleagues form the Princeton safe internet programming group, which is still running to this day. One of the best security groups anywhere. 
My, my, my office mate, Dan Wallach, is one of the top security experts now at Rice. So I'm doing the security stuff, hanging out at Netscape, and we realize we have some pretty interesting products. Uh, my two co-founders are both Princeton guys, start the company, and ultimately Intertrust, which was a rights management company, realized how important this technology was. What's going on at that time? Napster just happened. Literally, stuff's getting co- stuff is getting copyright infringed left and right. And they realized some of the core technology we developed would be very good for rights management to basically get paid for the music. And they had a very visionary CEO who hired me, uh, bought the technology from my company, and then came into my office with, with really one of the strangest offers ever. It's like, Paul, I'm buying your company, uh, but there's only one part of the deal. If I buy your company, you can never write another line of code again. I'm like, what? Dude, I wrote most of the code base. Like, why would you hire me? He's like, Martino, you're a geek, but you speak in complete sentences. So you're going to join me in the front of the office, okay? That's the deal. You write code, you're out. And that was a very lucky, important break for me because I then got to work with Duncan Davidson, who I started uh, uh, Bullpen Capital with. We got to take the company public. We got to run the M&A group. I learned all the stuff you need to know that you'd learn in GSB. I learned on the job, during the tech bubble. Uh, I was on a panel with Ice-T and Jimmy Jam talking about the future mm. music distribution. And, and Ice-T told me, what did I know? Because when, when, I was, when he was my age, uh, he, he was actually in a different profession. And I encourage the listeners to look up what Ice-T's profession was when he was about 21 or 22. You can imagine that that was a fun conversation. Duncan Davidson. So some lessons from him. So Duncan, he's like, look, Martino, you work for me. I had business development. I'm going to take the company public. We're going to go buy stuff. Let's go have a lot of fun. And uh, I, I got to do all of the stuff you dream about when you're like, you're a, a, a GSB student, you know, or a Harvard. Like I got to do that in 99, in 2000, during the bubble in one of the coolest categories out there, music. Um, we would have parties at the House of Blues and, in, in uh, you know, on Sunset Strip and, you know, people like uh, Cypress Hill would show up to our parties because we were cool. And I'm like, this is, this is awesome. Did you know Fabrice Grinda in those days? It seems like you have a lot of similar parallel paths in the music industry and in VC world. No, no, no. I don't. Uh, there were so many weird doors into music at that time from tech. Like this panel, I always remember I was on, I was Jimmy Jam vignette which was a which was a content management system and iced tea you're sitting there going you got a rights management person a content management system a music writer and a a celebrity on a panel like who thought that was a good idea that was the kind of weird mixing that was going on back then and it's not a surprise that i missed a lot of people because there were so many at this intersection sports gaming media technology and and I've stayed at this intersection for, you know, the next 25 years of my life, actually. We'll circle back to bullpen cap and some of your other co-founders and managing partners. Cause you have a really an amazing team there, um, including who you mentioned, Duncan Davidson, but um, so next was tribe next or there was sky pilot network part of that. So yeah, so Sky Pilot, I try and forget because that was a lost year. I mean, it was a lost year in a lot of ways. That was, Sky Pilot was basically 01 to 02. We're at the bottom of the tech bust, right? The bottom of the NASDAQ was, was April of 02. That was that lost year coming off the bubble. People don't remember how bad the employment situation was. Santa Clara lost 20% of its jobs in 18 months. Like that's like, uh, I mean, that, that's depression level job loss. Uh, and, and it was no fun to be in Silicon Valley. Duncan had managed be- off of his strong resume to start the company, but it was just everything was going, up, pulling a boulder uphill. Nothing was working. But then what happened, and we'll get to Tribe in a second, but what was exciting about Tribe was Tribe was at the bottom. See, starting a company at the bottom is awesome. Starting a company on the way down sucks. That's the big difference. Like, it's not a bad idea to start a company in a, a bear market. It's cheaper to get office space. It's easier to hire people. But when the knife is still falling, which was that 01, 02 year at Skypilot, it was just people are white knuckling. They don't know what to do. We had a big partnership with, with AOL. We could never get right because everyone was scared about losing their job. 
what, what, a, what a tough time. And yes, I did my one year there. Um, Duncan and I got to work together there. And I told him, Duncan, if we ever work together again, um, I, I'm telling you, it'll be years from now and you'll work for me this time. <laughs> and so we'll get, to, we'll get to bullpen later. But when we started bullpen, I said, Duncan, you remember that conversation a decade ago? So, so it is important, though, to work with people that you know and trust multiple times. And when SkyPilot basically failed and, you know, it got Aqua hired into another company. I forget the exact details. I had known Mark Pincus through Matt Aqua for a long time. And it was April of 02. And he's like, let's, you know, let's go do something in this space. He was an early investor in Friendster. He knew that this would be a big category. I was like, this looks flaky, but what the hell? Let's go give it a try. But Mark was always way out of the curve. He said, not only that, let's do the company in San Francisco. All the tech stuff's going to move to San Francisco. And like nobody was in San Francisco at that time. Everything was in Palo Alto and Mountain View. And Mark really, uh, while a challenging guy to work for a lot of ways, always way ahead of the curve in terms of seeing where the ball's going. Uh, perhaps the most gifted person I've ever worked with in that regard. So talk about Tribe for a second. So we were in the right place, right time. We knew what was going on. Um, Reed Hoffman was an advisor. He was starting LinkedIn. We knew, we knew that, um, uh, we knew Friendster well, but we kept trying to put a square peg in a round hole together. We kept trying to go after Craigslist by having socially linked classifieds. Pincus was obsessed with two things at the time, Friendster and Craigslist. Craigslist was making tons of money, but it was unsafe. Friendster was growing at a tremendous clip, but there was nothing to do after you caught up with your buddies. He insisted that the idea would be classified listings with people who you knew. So the guy who came to your house to buy your car, you could vet via your network. So his instincts were right, but this tension between the classified listings and working with the newspapers like Knight Ritter and all those people on the left and building a general purpose social network on the right, we never got it right. That, that, that unison was wrong, even though the two macro trends were correct. And at the time, you know, uh, what, one of my favorite stories about Facebook is when, when Zuckerberg was still a student at Harvard, he came to the tribe office. Peter Thiel called him up. He said, you should go meet my friend, Mark Pincus. And in typical Pincus fashion, Pincus goes, look, Thiel's got this guy coming by. I'm flying my plane this week. Can you go meet this kid? And so I got to babysit Mark Zuckerberg at the tribe office for a week as a favor to Mark, as a favor to Peter Thiel. This is while he was still a student at Harvard. And I was very confused. I'm like, Mark, this guy's going to go build something to compete with us. And like, what am I supposed to do here, dude? <laughs> so what was that week like? What did you do? Uh, you know, I, I realized one very strange thing, and I think it's true to this date. While I have tremendous respect for uh, Mark Zuckerberg and whether he's built at Facebook, I was confused by Mark. He, he was very, very socially awkward. He was kind of a tough guy to hang out with in the conference room. And yeah, I know there was some competitive tension, but I remember literally, I remember putting my, his phone number in my phone thinking, this guy's going to build the great social network? <laughs> Just one thing you can laugh about in retrospect, because his product vision and his understanding of the target audience and being exclusive for the college kids. He was so far ahead of all of us, but his user interface to him as a person belied how smart he was about the business he was building. <laughs> was he sharing any of that during that week of what he was thinking or not really? I don't think he, yeah. at that week, I don't think he knew it yet. He was, it was germinating. Remember, he hasn't even quit Harvard yet. You know, the infamous meeting with, uh, with, with the Winklevi and, and, and the president of the university, uh, like that hasn't happened yet. That's like a year away. You had some kind of hand in this butterfly effect that like went on, right? Um, it was funny. And, and look, and it was, uh, it was interesting. The early days of social networking, the companies all knew each other. When MySpace launched, they invited us to the launch party in LA because we had started Tribe. So, Unlike enterprise software, where all the companies are at each other's throats, all the early social networks, the founders were all kind of friends. And yes, we were competitors. And yes, there was some raw nerve between like Mark Pincus and, and, um, and, and, and you know, the Friendster founder. And, you know, some of that was, 
you know, felt like, well, you invested in me and then you compete it with me. So there were some hard hurt feelings between some people, but by and large, we all knew each other. We knew Zuckerberg, right? We, we, we knew Tom at, at, at MySpace because he invited us to the opening day party because why wouldn't he invite the tribe guys? It's just the way we all thought in those days. Yeah, I mean, and also it's like, we're all a part of all of these social media, you know, channels. It's not like, well, I'm going to join LinkedIn and not join Facebook. Right. I mean, we, everyone joins different social networks. What do you think, what was your you know, kind of postmortem on MySpace? So MySpace was always a weird UI built on cold fusion. And it always looked like a 12 year old built your website. And I insisted to people, MySpace will never take off. No way. And so when MySpace had won for a very short period of time, I was like, it can't possibly keep winning. And so I, I didn't know if I was saying that because I wanted to be right or because I trusted my intuition. And so when something came up that was cleaner and better and had, had a more targeted audience and had thought through the page design better, I felt like it was always vulnerable. Mm. And then just to show you that I can be wrong yet again, I then assumed something would come after Facebook and supplant it because the switching costs were low. So uh, I got it more wrong than right. But on MySpace not being able to maintain its lead, I just think that, that fundamentally from a product perspective, there's no way that that product would have been the long-term winner. So you spent a lot of time working aggregate knowledge. Yep. Talk about aggregate knowledge. So aggregate knowledge, very simple insight. So tribe fails, but Pincus and I learned two very important things. One, there's nothing else to do on a social network. Hence, I want to let you play games, equals Zynga. Second thing was the social network might not be great for a lot of things, but the data about the users telling you about themselves will be the most valuable ad targeting data set in the history of mankind. That's aggregate knowledge. And so tribe is one of those famous, successful failures. It's like Go or General Magic. It's one of those companies, right space, maybe a little ahead of its time, got it wrong, but spawns other great companies because the right people were there working on the right problem. And we knew that the data set coming off of social networks would be a, a data set unlike any advertiser had ever seen before in their life to recommend you products, to recommend you a general contractor, to, to tell, you know, hell, to tell you who you should marry, right? I mean, we, we knew that the data set was there and, and that's what aggregate knowledge was all about. So do you take that route as opposed to Zynga just because that's more of an interest to you? It's more what I was good at, right? Think about my background. I, I'm a PhD dropout in high performance computing. My PhD work is in security, high performance systems, that kind of stuff. I'm not a direct to consumer guy. I don't have the right insight things for it. I built Tribe, but I built the back-end scalability of Tribe, which was outstanding for its time. And a guy named Brian Lawler built the front-end because I'm just not a, I'm not a front-end guy. And so Brian and I split the company in two halves. Brian and Elliot. Elliot went on to do wonderful things too. He, he, he uh, did Genie with Dave Sachs. Um, Brian Lawler ended up going to Cisco in the acquisition of, of Tribe. Tribe's tech got acquired by Cisco along the way. That's a Another funny story, but so we split the world that way. And so when it comes time for me to go build the next thing, I'm never going to be the person to figure out the direct to consumer thing that happens next. Mark was going to figure that out. And that was Zynga. I was going to figure out the next plumbing thing to happen. And that's what aggregate knowledge was. Hmm. And so aggregate gets acquired. Yep. Then what? So I had stepped down as, uh, into chairman mode uh, to hire Dave Jakubowski per the story. And I wasn't sure what I was gonna do next. I was actually thinking I'd probably go start my next company. But Mike Maples over at Floodgate, he kept bugging me, he kept calling me. Uh, Martino, you're good at this angel investing. At the time I was an angel investor in Udemy, Zynga, Millennial Media. I had a, I had a real string of, of good hits as an angel investor. It's like, Martino, you, you're good at this angel thing. Why don't you come join me as my first partner at Floodgate? And I, I, I flat rejected him. I said, you venture people are a bunch of weenies. The real, the real stuff is building the company. Like, I ain't quitting, Mike. I, I'm going to go build another company. Um, and then what happened is through the course of the year where I stepped down as CEO 
and was thinking about what my next gig was, Mike really got me thinking about how the venture industry was getting changed. I was an early limited partner in Josh Koppelman's first round capital. And people don't really appreciate how important first round capital was to the history of the venture ecosystem. It was really one of the first innovative venture funds that thought, if it's cheap to start a company, I need to run my venture fund in a different way than the funds have been run for 20 or 30 years before us. I'm gonna write a lot of checks at high volume. I'm gonna let my losers fail fast. That was not what you did in venture in 05. But what happens is now Josh is starting to get a lot of respect. 09, 10, 11, he did Uber in the summer at 10. People are starting to say, hey, maybe that cute little thing that Koppelman was doing over there is not such a bad idea. So Mike's bugging me to take a job. I'm good friends with Phil Black over at True. And then it starts dawning on me. I'm like, I know I want to start a new company, but my insight is actually in venture. If the venture ecosystem is getting reinvented, what is the next thing after first round capital? So I reluctantly started a venture fund because it was the only way to capitalize on the entrepreneurial instinct around the changing venture ecosystem. And Mike Maple red asses me to this day. He's like, yeah, dude, you to go become a weenie just to show everyone you were right about what you wanted to do as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Joke's on you. So talk about the inception of Bullpen, Cap. Think about it. At the time, 2010, there are only about 40 micro funds, Floodgate, Felices, First Round. I mean, literally, there's 40. There are about 100 traditional venture funds, Greylock, um, you know, uh, Kleiner Perkins, Sequoia, all those guys. But I'm sitting there going, if you can go write checks at Josh's volume, you can go raise a $25 million fund and compete with him. So I remember telling Mike, we went from 20 to 40 over the last couple of years. What's going to happen to you as a business when we go from 20 to 200? Aren't you going to need a fund in between to basically get a little bit more money to your winners before they're ready for Sequoia? Now, fast forward a decade later, we went from 20 funds to 2,000 funds. So, so I was right, but still wrong. I was off by a zero. So my crazy prediction that there'd be 200 micro funds was surpassed and there were 2,000. So the opportunity for bullpen to play in the middle where first round and floodgate are the starting pitchers and Sequoia and Kleiner are the closers to play bullpen, which is how we got the name. We are functionally the middle reliever. The opportunity set for our fund was bigger than I ever imagined because no one in the right mind thought there'd be 2000 copycat. Mm. So you talk about your co-founders uh, at bullpen cap. So, I'm sitting, Duncan Davidson and I have been angel investing together. And he has this friend, Rich Melman. All right, Melman, you know, just started this little company in 1982 called Electronic Arts, right? Just, you know, he's just been around a couple of times. Uh, he's got a great, you should get, listen, you should get Melman on this show because he can tell you stories. Melman was employee 60 at Intel. He was the founder of Electronic Arts in 82. And before that, he brought the spreadsheet to market with Dan Bricklin. And he once told Steve Jobs to F off in his office because Steve was trying to figure out how to build a spreadsheet on his Apple. And the only guys in the world who knew how to do it were the two guys that Melman worked with in Boston. That's an awesome story. I can't give it justice. But so Melman has an office in, uh, on Sand Hill Road and Duncan and I keep meeting him there. And I don't really know Rich at this point in time. I know him a little bit from before. He was a small investor in aggregate knowledge. He looks at me, he's kind of like, you're here at the office so damn much. Here's a key. <laughs> like, literally, I hardly know the guy. He gives me a key to the office. I'm like, okay, I guess I'm going to hang out at your office. So as we're brainstorming this, Rich is more and more sitting at the whiteboard with me and Duncan. So about a year in, it was all of the year of 2010, Melman looks over at me one day. He goes, hey, kid, I gave you a key. We're going to quit our day jobs and do this now, right? <laughs> and so we did. We literally quit our jobs. And started bullpen. We started two days before Christmas, December 23rd, 2010. And, and I can now say I started a company with the founder of Electronic Arts and I've started a company with the founder of Zynga. That's, I feel pretty good on founding companies with, with game people. What does do this mean? So let's do this. What's next? There's a lot that has to go into it, I imagine. And, and, and I had no idea what I was getting into. Raising money for a venture fund is different than raising money for, for, uh, 
for a company. Let's do it, man. We are now full time on this. Our other side activities are in the rearview mirror. We're going to incorporate the entity. We're going to go hunt for our first money and we're going to start writing checks. And we're going to act like it's a company, even if it's not. That's actually a very important moment in the history of any startup. There's this moment where you're just glorified bullshitting. And then there's this moment where you decide that you're a company. And so Rich, Rich decided for me that that was the point at which we're a company. And, and, and yes, the next couple months were still kind of really figuring it out, but let's go get our first couple million dollars. Let's start writing checks. Let's go do this. And, and we did it. And, and I, I remember it clear as day, him looking at me and going, we're going to do this now, right? How was it the raising money for venture funds different from pharma company? And then probably simultaneously, are you vetting companies that you are presenting to these people that you are looking at? So we have to, we have to, we have to make, make, fake it till you make it. We have to, we have to, if you're a poker player, it's a semi bluff, right? We, we've got to start writing small checks right out of our pocket and act like a fund, even though we're raising the money or else no one will think we're a fund and no one will give us the money as a first time fund manager. So you got to kind of will yourself into existence. And, you know, we got the first couple million dollars, literally $4 million. It was me and Duncan and Rich and people we had made money for. We called them up and said, you're giving us 250 grand, like send it here. No questions. Like don't, don't ask the economics. And guys like Monaco were, were some of those first checks. And Matt was a huge mentor, now runs Data Collective, R really, really was a great mentor to us on how to run a venture fund. He was at SoftBank before and Vantage Point before that. So we had four million bucks for writing checks. Luckily, one of those first checks was a $250,000 check to this little seven person company in Edinburgh, Scotland, started by a husband and wife called Bandol. Um, that proved to be a pretty good check. $8 million valuation at the time we invested. Company years later exits for $14 billion. So nice to get one of your first checks into a company like that. That's amazing. That went through some crazy times, the FanDuel. Crazy times is an understatement. Um, the Attorney General of New York tried to throw the board of directors in jail. Um, you know, People referred the CEO for criminal prosecution because of running an illegal gambling operation. We tried to merge with DraftKings and the FTC kiboshed the merger. I mean, I learned more about arcane aspects of the law. And, and oh, by the way, the company's in Edinburgh, Scotland, just to make it even more complicated. Uh, so yeah, there were things that we signed, that, that we, we ended up doing that we sure didn't sign up for when we made an investment in that company. Uh, and, and literally, there's a whole book written about it called Dueling with Kings, the history of DraftKings and FanDuel. There's some great interviews and stories in that book about those crazy times. and, and it, 2015, FanDuel and DraftKings, we're spending more than Geico to advertise. I mean, literally, in, in September, the start of the football season, we're spending more than Geico. Do you know how much Geico spends on advertising? So why did you, what did you see in, in FanDuel? Because I'm sure you were vetting a lot of companies at the time. And why did you decide on FanDuel? FanDuel had awesome monetization on a small user base. This was very unusual at that time. Most apps had large user bases and no monetization. He is the exact opposite. He's the classic example of a Peter Thiel zero to one company. Dominating market share of a small market that you think could be big. I am mentally built more like Peter than I am the rest of the venture ecosystem. Contrarian at heart, zero to one style company. So FanDuel spoke to me. I immediately knew I wanted to invest. And Nigel's in my office, the CEO, he's telling me, you know, Paul, I pitched 70 funds, like I've gotten 70 no's. I, this is where I call Matt Akko up. I call, I call Akko, Akko, you're my advisor. This is the biggest no brainer I'm ever gonna see. How come everybody's telling him no? He's like, Martino, that's what you wait for in the business. When you're the one person who sees it that clearly, write as big a check as you can, that, and remember that feeling and hope you get it again in your career. So have you gotten it again? Yeah, there are a couple of times now where I looked at it and I said, yep, that Melman says this, that has to happen. Um, and and that's, a, that's a good feeling. Let me give you an example. I don't know anything about K through 12 education software. It's a notoriously difficult market. Guy comes in my office from Montreal, who's a former school teacher, 
named Phil Cutler. And he says, Paul, I have a solution to address educational inequities in K through 12. I was like, really? Like, why does anybody buy that? Isn't the sales cycle terrible? And I'm like, like geez, what, you know what? Paul, I'm the only thing that principals can buy from their Title I budget. Call up a couple of my principals. I call up a couple of his principals. He's like, yeah, Paul, we get this evergreen money every year called Title I. And there's no qualified vendors to address the solution of inequity in the districts. Mm. We buy Phil's product and Phil, we like a lot and we're going to buy more stuff from him. So I go back to my partners. I'm like, guys, this guy figured out something nobody else did. He has an evergreen budget that he's got one of the only products that fits in. I know I don't know anything about K through 12 software. I know the companies in Montreal of all places. Then COVID hits. The company literally went from like 1 million in revenue to 30 million in revenue in like 12 months because education inequity is a top topic and COVID exacerbates the problem. I mean, literally like one to 30, like that doesn't happen. You don't go from one to 30 and like 12. And again, I don't have the numbers right. And, and I'm sure, sure Phil would be the guy to tell you, IVP comes in and puts a hundred million dollars in the company a year after we invested a $12 million valuation in a backwater K through 12 software company that no one wants to touch in Montreal. But he was right and I knew he was right. And he convinced me he was right because I talked to those principals who were his buyers. And that was again, one of those moments. And my partners looked at me, they're like, if there's one deal we're never gonna make money in this fund on, it's that, it's that company paper that you did. So it's a hard business though. I'm not ripping my partners. This is a very hard business. What do you look at when you're evaluating a company coming in? Because I'm sure you get a lot of people coming and pitching you. We look for good metrics and a CEO with mastery of them. So look, I invest in Ipsy and Cosmetics. I invest in FanDuel and Fantasy. I invest in Spot Hero and Parking. I, I invest in paper and K through 12 software. How can I possibly know about all those categories? The answer is I can't possibly. But what happens is I have CEOs who come into my office who have such mastery of a business with already good metrics that I know that I'm underwriting to my belief in that CEO and their understanding of the business as opposed to my understanding of their business. And so Randy Commissar told me this a long time ago, and Bill was an advocate of this, Bill Campbell as well. There are three kinds of people in venture. There are product pick pickers, there are people pickers, and there are market pickers. So my partner, Rich Melman's a market picker. Oh, that has to happen. That's his phrase. He says that a lot. I'm a people picker. I, I, I can relax my judgment on the product and the market because I know how to pick people. Um, Rich relaxes his judgment on people and products to rely on the market. Uh, and the best venture people are one of the three and they know which one they are to play to their strengths. Hmm. Can you talk about, and you have to name names here, Paul, but an example would be that seems like a great company. The metrics are there, but the CEO, like you're mentioning the people per the people parts, not there. They don't know their numbers or whatever you're seeing in the people part. Not what are those, those missing things that you saw in those instances that you're all the, you know, the other things kind of look great, but you thought the people part was not there. Yeah. I, I would say, so at Bullpen, we have an unusual screening process. We start with the metrics and then we move to the kind of, do we like the team? Most venture firms invert it. They, they, they do it, start with the team, start with the market. We start with the numbers. Show me the existing business. This allows us, by the way, to screen a lot of companies people would otherwise not see, right? We get to see a company like Paper because his numbers are great, even though it's not a sexy space because we invert the screening pyramid. But we get to the bottom of the pyramid. We have to now answer that question. And I would say that the preponderance of our bottom of the pyramid knows are because we couldn't get on board with the management team. Mm. That's the preponderance. If you've made it to our partner meeting and you get a no, it's very likely because we could not get on board with, um, with basically the quality of the team yet on the field. So what, do you, what have you seen with that piece? Like, you meet the team, what, what are the missing pieces that they are showing you? Don't know how to, or don't have interest in hiring. That's one we see as a huge red flag over and over. You sit there, you go, okay, show me your hiring plan. Oh, the product's built. You know, I need to hire two salespeople, we're good. 
well, no, like you need a CMO. You need a CFO. Oh, have you ever done a retained search? Oh no, they cost too much money. I'll never do one. So let me tell you why you do a retained search. And if that CEO then goes, well, I'll never do that. I mean, that's, that's like, well, you're telling me you're not ready to grow up. You want to you wanna play in the kiddie pool a little longer. Like, I'm here to show you how to play with the big kids. You want to leave the kiddie pool of a couple million dollars in seed money and go get 100 million bucks from IVP. You want to get on the bullpen train. I'm going to show you how to do that. And if you don't want to do the things you need to do to get on the bullpen train, hire people, grow the team, do retain searches, improve your finance function, et cetera. It's pretty quick at a conversation to, with the CEO to see, do they want to do those things? Do they have the headroom to learn how to do those things? Are they motivated to do those things? And as Bill Campbell always said, Martino, you can't coach height. Are they tall enough? <laughs> you, you can give all the training you want, but if they ain't tall enough, it's tough to get the ball in the basket. So there is a, there's a coachability piece there too. Like you're giving feedback on the spot. It is, again, I would say coachability is among the single most important factors when we look at a company. Is there a way to, like you growing up, like when you go in and you've had these mentors and these colleagues and you've taken their advice, is there a way to, um, you know, people who have kids or colleagues, is there a way to coach coachability? Coach coachability? Yeah. Because you, you, I guess, you know, took to that, right? I mean, maybe naturally, I don't know. Is there something from your upbringing that maybe allowed you to be more coachable um, or not, right? It seems like that's a big factor. No, that's right. You know, I've never thought about that question. I, I, uh, so I'm not going to give you a glib answer because it's a very deep question. Is coachability a learned skill or a native skill? I'll bet it's both, but, but it's interesting it's immediately obvious the ones that are coachable and is it learnable? The people who are coachable know that there's somebody smarter on a topic than them and want to seek out that smarter person so they can get better. There's this self-improvement part to coachability that requires you to have an open mind and, and, and a desire and ability to learn new things. Uh, is that coachable or not? I don't know. But it's really easy to tell when the person has that because they're not afraid to get on the phone with the one person in the world smarter than them on the topic, as opposed to they're, they're intimidated that they finally got somebody smarter than them about something they think they're smart about. And that's just the, your brain's oriented that way or it's not. I'm going to really think about that question because it's profound. I wonder if um, it has to do with failures. I don't know, maybe because along the journey you experience certain points where like you didn't win that it humbles up it humbles you it possibly it could be and, and look you, you you go wow it hurt losing I, I i don't want to do that again so what can i learn from it you know first of all paul i want to thank you i have one last question uh, before i ask it i want to point everyone to go to bullpencap.com check out more about your team their investments if you are who's a good fit like jeremy if someone listens to this this is the this is the type of company that should be contacting us you're 12 to 18 people you've raised three to five million dollars in prior seed it's early but it works and you know you might be able to go talk to the Series A funds and get your 20 million bucks, but they're probably going to tell you to come back in nine to 12 months. That's when you call bullpen. Are there certain industries that you like more than others or doesn't matter? We'll do just about anything. Love it. So last question, everyone should go bullpencap.com. Anywhere else online we should point people towards or is that the best, best spot? Certainly the best place to best find spot. Yep. So you created this, I mentioned in the beginning, this film, Inside Game. That seems, again, one of these random things when I look at your whole trajectory. So I want to talk about that and, and briefly, um, you know, have you talk about what you're working on, uh, the bankroll project. Very good. So look, um, my cousin was involved in one of the 
largest scandals in the history of betting and sports in the United States. His, my cousin Thomas Martino, along with Tim Donahue, a now notorious referee, and a third party, uh, uh, a big better named James Batista, orchestrated one of the most elaborate sports betting schemes in the history of the world. They used inside information from Tim about unreported injuries and bad blood between refs and players to, to bet on the games that Tim had inside info on. In my opinion, and this is subject to debate, but I've known Tim and Tommy and Jimmy since I was born, since I was a little kid. I've known all three of them since I was a kid. Uh, people disagree about this, but this is my opinion. Tim never really made bad calls in the games he officiated. He didn't need to. He, he had so much inside information about that referee was going to call the game that way because he didn't like the player that he didn't need to influence the games. Some of the games that they bet on, they were so in the money that him calling fouls flagrantly would have only tipped his hand off. He actually probably called fouls against his bet to make it look better because he knew that that other ref was going to go hard on the player. So did Tim make bad calls in the games? In my opinion, no. Did he do something, you know, untoward? Of course, he was using inside information. He was relaying it to a third party. They went 33-5 and five against the spread in the 38 games that they bet on. And Tim insists that two of them he got wrong because my cousin Tommy uh, was too, 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 busy, too busy smoking his own dope to get the bet right. Um, but when you have three knuckleheads from South Philly, from Delaware County, moving millions of dollars on behalf of some of the largest bettors in the world, you've got the mafia on one side, you have the FBI on the other, and the NBA somewhere else. I remember telling Tommy, I'm like, could you piss off anybody else with what you did? I'm like, one day this will make a great movie. And when they got out of jail, that's what we did. I bought the life rights from Tommy. We got a script written. And I told him, I said, I don't know about making a movie, but it's an entrepreneurial endeavor. One day, if I meet the right person, let's go do it. Chance meeting with a guy named Michael Pierce, who made one of the great gambling movies of all time called The Cooler with William H. Macy. He's like, he literally looks at me, he goes, a venture capitalist from Silicon Valley is going to hand me a script in a restaurant in Beverly Hills? Oh, geez. What, how cliche does it get? I tell Pierce, I'm a good guy to have owe you a favor. You're going to read the damn thing. He read it. He called me up that night. He says, yeah, let's go make it. And that's, that's how it happened. Bring us home with the bankroll project. So I'm on the board of FanDuel for years. We're advertising against Geico, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I remember sitting there thinking, wouldn't it be more fun to get the hundreds of millions of dollars than be writing the checks for the hundreds of millions of dollars? So we kept thinking, wouldn't it be better to be the media company getting all the sports betting, all the DFS daily fantasy money? So now that there's all the radio stations doing advertising, et cetera, I was like, what if we did what Alan Bushnell did when he came up with the idea for Chuck E. Cheese, a next generation entertainment venue? What if we built a restaurant that had cool stuff on the screens and you could do betting on your phone, but yet celebrities came in and gave interviews and FanDuel and DraftKings wrote us checks to sign up players to their app. You'd have the best of all worlds. You'd have a look and feel like a Vegas style casino, but no money would change hands. It'd all be on your phone. The players could come and give interviews because it's a restaurant. And why don't you team up with one of the best restaurant tours in Philadelphia? I won't tell you his name because we haven't announced it, but let's make it one of his restaurants. And I'll bet we can make a higher margin than FanDuel does because we'll make 80 to 90% margins on those affiliate fees and FanDuel's in an 8% margin sports betting business. And that's what Bankroll is. It will be the first of its kind next generation sports entertainment site. We're going to be at 19th and Chestnut in Philly opened in May of next year. It's going to be awesome. What's uh, where should they check out more? Where online would be the best place? Don't have anything up just yet, uh, but it's going to be up there. I think it'll be on bankrollclub.com when it's up. Probably by the time this interview is out, we'll have some more information available. All right. Well, check out bankrollclub.com. If it's not there, just wait. Paul, I'm the first one to thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Great time. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See, like like a beach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand